So we are delighted to welcome as our speaker this evening, Associate Professor David Hasty, who is Deputy Vice President Development at Alpha Crucis University College and Executive Director of the state funded National Embedded Cross Sector Teacher Education Pilot. He has served as a member of the New South Wales Council of Deans of Education and was seconded in 2022 by ACARA and the Federal Education Minister as an expert consultant on the new Australian history and civics curriculum. He has published widely in academic and mass media, including detailed examinations of the role of religion in the 19th century public education acts, the role of religion in historical and contemporary ed Australian education more generally. David previously served as education strategist for the Anglican Schools Corporation and prior to that as an educator in four independent schools. Thank you very much, David Hasty. Thank you so much, Erin. And don't worry, I just asked for an extension to 7.30 in case the questions kick off. I'm actually going to not talk until 7.30. I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes or 40 minutes and then we'll get a chance to get into the questions. I'm going to start by handing around one of my treasures here tonight. And you can handle it because some vandal in the past screwed a piece of perspex onto it. It's actually an original poster warning parents of what happens if you don't send them to school in 1880. And just a word to the wise, don't ever tell the antiques dealer that you've published on the ob object you're trying to buy before you've uh, ar arrived at a price. <laughs> And so, imprisonment for a term of not more than seven days. Please feel free to hand it around and have a look. Having got your attention, our guiding question is as follows. What is the nature and vocation of Anglican schools as educational communities in Australian society? There are many ways to approach this question. Our approach today will be to examine the historical perspective specifically in relation to the Sydney Anglican Diocese schools. The guiding question you will notice is not phrased as a theological question. It's an institutional and a political question, how the sacred and the secular might coexist. This is deliberate and I dare say for some provocative. Why? Over the years, I have become increasingly unsatisfied by mine and others' attempts to understand Australian Christian schools from a purely theological viewpoint. Schools are immensely complex and immensely complex artefacts of history and society and the history we shall explore tonight I think bears this out. Theologies are present across the historical record of the Sydney Anglican Church's approach to schools. You've got, and I'm not a theologian so I might have got these terms wrong, um, but they're probably technical enough to bore some people. So I get more interesting after this slide. Theological anthropology, drawing from the incarnation, post-resurrection social restoration theologies, covenantal theologies, particularly to do with the family, more old covenant than new, truth be told. Soteriology or theologies of the atonement are also there, of course, evangelism. However, only recently and by far the least. So no theology is actually given primacy in the historical rationale for or functioning of Anglican schools in the historical record. It's more a potpourri that's sprinkled through the history, complexly woven into several other factors and purposes of schooling. There was a lack of coherent language and a lack of rationale amongst this complexity that principals knew keenly and had to deal with every day, particularly when the media got involved. This being my starting point, I'm going to run institutional rather than a theological perspective. I'm going to now turn to a rather high-end quote that, by its acuity, I suspect may have emanated from the sharp pen of Edwin Judge in 1964. Church and state are simply the appropriate controlling instruments of two types of society into which an almost coterminous community organises itself. And if, like me, you had to look up coterminous, it means having the same borders or limits. This insight was published in the Synod's 1964 Special Commission into Education, which, amongst the many Synod reports into education, 
remains the most erudite. It also stated what is still evident today, that the diocese has never formulated a policy on education which coordinated its large responsibilities to the state system with the aims of its own schools. As we briefly journey through the history of Anglican schools today, please do not think for one moment that what I say is what Erin thinks. Erin Mollenhauer, the wonderful senior archivist in the Donald Robinson Library who's organised this event tonight. Why don't we give her a round of applause? Big thanks, Erin. <laughs> nor is what I'm about to say necessarily the position of the Anglican Church, nor of any school, nor of Alpha Christus University College. My truths are mine alone, but my mother has agreed to take responsibility for all of my errors. <laughs> I think she's watching tonight. So let's start with some basic facts. There's five basic epochs in Sydney Anglican schooling, chronologically. The first 18, 80, 1788 to 1826 is the ascendancy of the colonial chaplains. It was the churches, not the government, of all sects who provided basic elementary schools in a wild colony and just a handful of secondary schools, none of which survive. Then we have, in 1826 to 1880, the failure of an organised approach, one of the top five topics of the day, which included parliament, democracy, the end of transportation and the gold rush. This was one of the top five. The first attempt was the Anglicans in the Church and Schools Corporation by the cantankerous Archdeacon Scott. The whole thing was a debacle and failed within four years, and Scott's replacement, Australia's first bishop, William Grant Broughton, established the King's School in the vacuum. Governor Richard Burke then proposed introducing the Irish national system of non-denominational schooling in 1836, which had been designed to mitigate the deep sectarian differences in both New South Wales and in Ireland that was leading to such a poor education for their children. This was vigorously and successfully opposed by William Grant Broughton. This then led to a period of struggle over whether state schools or denominational schools should constitute Australian education, elementary education, which was a struggle across eight governors, William Grant Broughton resisting four of them and his successor, Bishop Barker, trying to resist the other four. Then we arrive at the 80-year period from 1880 to 1963, and it's from 1880 that we really will focus. The end and then the resumption of state aid to church schools. In 1880, the New South Wales Public Instruction Act finally removed all state funding to church schools. In 1963, state aid to church schools was partially restored in a limited form. Throughout this period, the great GPS schools and their many emulations in Sydney were also established, basically stimulated by the initiatives of the short-lived but colourful leadership of Bishop Barry, Bishop Barker's successor. Then we have the fourth epoch, 1963 to 1994, the decline of church influence in public schooling and an increasing separation of the Anglican church from the social settlement in state schools and beyond where the church begins to shift its focus back to emphasising its own schools and 1994 to the present, although I'm really only going to talk up to 1994, the Anglican school revived the building of new schools and consolidation of old schools as an extra parochial arm in the life of the church. <coughs> Even though Bishop Broughton and Barker resisted the cause of public schooling, the clergy and the laity in the lead-up to 1880 were clearly in favour of the national schools. Consider these numbers. In 1865, we had 171 Anglican schools in New South Wales, which was the Sydney Diocese. 1879, 67 Anglican schools in New South Wales, 34 in Sydney. Three years later, 31 Anglican schools in Sydney. Two years later... 16 Anglican schools in Sydney. Only King's and St Catherine's survive from those schools. The rise of state schooling then becomes a form of civic Protestantism. In 
as an accepted and established form of Protestantism, particularly with the complete withdrawal of the Catholic Church from the public education system, which, by the way, and I've published on this, I think was a deliberate Protestant plot. So we're going to examine the nature and vocation of Anglican schools in the last two epochs after 1885 and what became of them over time. So we all know of the 23 current Anglican corporate schools, the great corporate schools currently operating in the Sydney Diocese, only two of which, already mentioned, were establishing prior to 1880. <clears throat> Those schools were modelled on the British Greater Public School System, or GPS system, which confusingly is the opposite of what we mean by public schools today, <laughs> although they're still called GPS, and one of them is actually a public school. It's confusing. Um, another interchangeable word I like to use is imperial schools, that is, having been established and run on an eth ethos of preparing, amongst others, members of the Australian ruling classes to lead the country. Uh, to lead from the centre of the establishment, which in the day meant Anglican, in the context of the British Empire. The first of these schools was King's in 1831, and the most recent established on those lines, arguably, was the Illawarra Grammar School in 1959. Those in highlight on the screen were bought by what was the forerunner for the Anglican Schools Corporation. So we also know of 23 newer Anglican schools all right. <coughs> started after 1980, only, only one of which has since closed, Shoalhaven. These are typically lower fee than the corporate schools and were, were perhaps established on different lines. However, many of these still operate as a lighter version of the corporate imperial schools as echoes of the older tradition, which is a trend that seems to naturally occur as these schools age, certainly in their school uniforms. And you'll see there again, those in highlight are those that were opened by the Schools Corporation, op opened or taken over by. However, there's a large, mostly forgotten story. Even though only 16 schools survived after 1880, in fact, 70 other Anglican schools that have now closed operated in the Sydney Diocese in between 1880 and 1975. 14 having already operating, operated before, prior to that date and the others having both opened and closed after the 1880 Act. This is a largely untold story and as far as I know, this address tonight is the first attempt to synthesise the story of these schools. As you look at this list and there's another page, please scan your eyes. If you know anything about any of these schools, please send me your stories. It's part of a larger um, project I'm involved in, in in the writing of the history of Australian independent schools and these are these wonderful little social vignettes. A lot of the information about them has been lost. The next screen, there you go again. Extraordinary stories, I mean take for example St Paul's Heber Chapel which was opened by Thomas Hassel in 1828 was still going in 1912, local legend says 1920, but I haven't been able to find any evidence of it, the St Lawrence schools operated for 106 years until they closed in 1936, their last site being the Dolls Point site that's just been bought by Scots. The Darlinghurst schools went for 114 years. These stories are all forgotten now, but they are a story of the Anglican schools in Sydney. It's a fascinating list. That was a wonderful little picture I found of some of the girls from Chatswood Church of England Girls Grammar School that, that shut in 1936. I think they're wonderful little cheeky girls. Um, such small remains with so many hands. And the vast majority of these schools were never mentioned in the Synod records, which is a loud silence. It seems that many Anglicans did not accept the social settlement of state schooling and established new schools, many at their own initiative rather than that of the diocese. The churches also filled the dire gap of secondary education, which 
was not really numerically addressed until uh, a period in our living memory, in my mother's generation, in the immediate post-war. High schools just simply weren't that available. <coughs> so to sum up, there have been a total of 115 Anglican schools in the Sydney Diocese since 1880, 45 of which still operate today. Amongst these schools, there have been a variety of forms. It is a bit confusing. You've got the diocese taking over an existing school and retrospectively applying an ordinance. You have different ordinances and relationships, a majority council, a minority council reporting with no ordinance, like the King's School still hasn't got an ordinance. Without an ordinance in an Anglican parish or what's known as a parochial school. A non-diocesan Church of England girls' school with a female head, but according to the patriarchal conventions of the time, needing male clergy patrons. Non-diocesan Church of England boys' school with an Anglican clergyman headmaster. Schools without a formal Church of England name or relationship with the diocese, but with very, very close ties to certain clergy and affiliated unclassified Protestant schools. <coughs> there also exists this less defined group of private schools that don't fit any of these categories, and I'm not talking about the big corporate schools from the other denominations like Knox, Knox or Scots or PLC Sydney. I've been able to find 89 other non-Catholic private schools that operated and closed in Sydney Diocese throughout this period, and many of these also appeared to have a permeable relationship with the Anglican diocese. So clergy are at the speech nights and giving all of their speeches and prizes and whatnot. So it's not going to be a stretch to say that since 1880, somewhere between 150 to 180 schools ran with formal, informal, proximal or symbolic relationships to the Anglican church, all outside of any government funding whatsoever. There's a parallel, a parallel network to the state schools and the Catholic schools, large enough to be normative, to be a part of the story of the streetscape, the story of the city of Sydney. Given all of this, it's extraordinary that the Synod only first attempts to define the categories of its Anglican schools in 1954. And this is because of a media scandal involving a fake Anglican school and a fake Anglican clergyman. Another Anglican ascendancy was also operating at strength elsewhere, however, in the public schools. The 1880 Public Instruction Act specifically describes the state schools as based on Christian principles, including compulsory religious education in the curriculum and also giving the, right, the churches the visiting rights of one hour a day to present to their flock. Now, the church actually paired this back to one hour a week because they couldn't cope with it. And so special religious education, or SRE, as it has become known, uh, began and exists to this day. As the inevitability of state schooling loomed, Bishop Barker reflected to the Synod in 1878 that few questions can be of, no, of, can be of more importance than the religious instruction of our children in public schools. In fact, as Riley Warren reflected in his gem of a master's thesis in 2013, thanks Riley, you gave me a lot of information, the proceedings of Synod show that Synod Sydney did not follow what Dickey suggests was the general pattern across Australia, and is something of a caricature today, by the way. Do nothing and concentrate on a few prestigious secondary schools. What emerges is that the Evangelical Diocese of Sydney undertook a determined three-pronged approach to reach its children. The three prongs were church schools, Sunday schools, and SRE. The Sunday School Institute was revived in 1881. Sunday schools in the day were massive, tens of thousands of children attending the Sunday schools. The Religious Instruction Committee for Church-led Religious Education in the Emerging New South Wales national schools had already been established in 1870 but was revived with intensity by Dean Cowper who chaired the committee and a series of long fold-out double-page lists, uh, very helpful for a historian, appear in the yearbook called Ecclesiastical Statistics including parish day schools, Sunday schools, 
SRE and public schools, student, students on the rolls, students actually attending, staff, the gender of staff, and so forth. The corporate schools submitted their own reports to Synod completely independent of these committees. So by 1885, 87% sorry, of Church of England children in public schools received religious instruction. These helpful lists occur in the yearbook until 1919, and it is clear that the SRE mission was pursued with seriousness and vigour. Bishop Barry, Bishop Barker's successor, was actually horrified when he arrived in the sea in 1884 to discover that the church had surrendered its control of elementary schooling. After two years, he, he appears to completely lose interest in SRE, rather focusing on a concerted vision to establish Anglican GPS schools. And so he establishes the Shaw School, the Cathedral School, he starts the process that leads to the establishment of the Skegg Schools, and he revitalises the King's School and St Catherine's School. However, with Barry's departure, the Anglican approach to schooling splits into two pathways, SRE and Sunday School on the one hand, and the Anglican approach to schooling on the other hand, the Anglican schools on the other hand, a split that formed over time into two different mindsets. The church, in partnership, a civic Protestant state partnership with state education, or the church as the builder of its own schools. And I would argue that in some ways this separation in the mindsets of Sydney Anglicans continues to this day. Just consider when teachers are prayed for in your parish, what teachers do they pray for? That's a little, little quiz. Go, go and uh, see if you can answer that question. All right, in 1919, the first of the Global Education Committees was formed, called the Board of Education. <clears throat> the Board was meant to serve the Synod by assisting the acquisition, establishment and maintenance of schools, providing for the official recognition of schools as Church of England schools, encouraging conferences with and amongst the governing bodies of exi existing schools, religious instruction in state schools and Sunday schools. Bring the whole show together. The Board of Education reports replaced, unfortunately, replaced these long charts of statistics and become increasingly focused on SRE and Sunday school with decreasing reference to church schools of any kind, ignoring the first three uh, activities in their audience. The last reference to church schools occurs in 1927 when they reflect that Meriden has been recognised as a church school. Thereafter, there was no organised approach to their own schools in the diocese for another 18 years. There appears to have been a, uh, a revolt in 1945 in the genteel manner of an Anglican revolt uh, that led to the formation of the Council for the Promotion, the, the succinctly named um, Council for the Promotion of Church of England Schools in 1947. This initially took on the roles apparently neglected by the Board of Education of attending to church schools but most importantly, expanding the base of Anglican schools primarily by mergers and acquisitions. The council later became known in 19, 1994 as the Anglican Schools Corporation, and through its agency has more than doubled the amount of Anglican schools in Sydney. The public education church-state arrangement continued for many decades. The Catholic Church on the outside in what for most of that time embodied a bitter sect sectarian divide that has been largely airbrushed over in accounts of Australian history. The Anglican SRE mission struggled at times, particularly with the rise of the state secondary schools after World War II, until, until the Synod made an inquiry in 57, being so shocked and alarmed by the startling facts revealed in the report on SRE, the drastic situation in the secondary schools, a compulsory levy was placed on the parishes uh, for, for the support of SRE, and this seemed to reverse the decline in SRE for a period. But a new old challenge, a new old challenge was emerging. <coughs> the Catholic schools were agitating for the resumption of state aid to church schools. 
particularly prompted by the rise of the Catholic population due to post-war migration from Catholic Europe. From 1951, there's evidence of the Sydney Anglican's first formal opposition to the idea of resumption of state aid. In 1956, Archbishop Mull was unequivocal. The Church of England has accepted the public... I should do an English accent because until Archbishop Lone, they were all Englishmen, but I won't. The Church of England has, accept, the Church of England has accepted the public school system in New South Wales and loyally supported it. Such a nationwide education for the children makes for unity, for community of interest, and for maintenance of national traditions, i.e. not Catholic. Any proposal to depart from this is fraught with the most serious consequences. In 1960, Archbishop Goff was also clear. A system of public education which is based in religious principles, as exemplified in the Education of Act of New South Wales, uh, is capable of satisfying the basic requirements of Christian education. In conducting some schools under its own control, the Church of England does not desire in any way to rival, supplant or impoverish the public education system only so long as church schools can be maintained by independent economic means is their existence justifiable. He also indicated that the Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptist Union and Congregational Union have all affirmed their opposition to the principle of state aid for church schools Resumption of state aid would revive the cost, chaos and inefficiency which preceded the 19, 1880 Public Instruction Act and multiply the element of religious segregation among parents and children. This could lead to the disintegration of the public education system as we know it. Prescient words. A particular vision for church and state was also captured by Archbishop Goff in 1962 is the life of the church woven into the fabric of national life? Or is the church to be shut away in the exclusion of its own pietistic groups, having no part to play in the affairs of the world? And so we see a peculiar reversal. The cessation, the cessation of state aid in the late 1870s was vigorously opposed by Archbishop Broughton and Barker, <coughs> but vigorously supported by Archbishop Smoll and Goff, and also by the Great Education Commission of 1964, with which we began this address. And on that education were some great ang Anglican luminaries, Professor Edward Judge, Ken Cable, Stephen Judd, and so forth. They all opposed the, re the resumption of state aid. However, the actual, clergy, the actual clergy and laity were breaking ranks as they had in 1880. In 1965, it soon became clear that Tara, Skeggs, Wollongong, Skeggs, Redlands, Redlands Abbotsley, Claremont and Shaw had already accepted government grants for capital works and science labs. And who could blame them? At this time, both the Menzies government and the Caldwell then Whitlam Labor opposition were clambering over each other to secure the Catholic vote. State aid became an inevitability and was grudgingly accepted by the Synod in the late 1960s. There had been a type of social settlement, a long social settlement, albeit to the exclusion of the large Catholic community, but it was a balance nonetheless, and one that had allowed in many ways the Anglican Church to take its position in society as the established church and take the existence of its own schools for granted some may say far too much. In 1965, there were 890,000 pupils in New South Wales, 24.8% of those were in non-government schools and only 1.5% were in Anglican schools. But the sources around about this time also note with increasing alarm the aberrant direction of state schools. As far back as 1962, the Archbishop had warned against an activist group called the Secular Education Committee. There's complaints about moral drift in the curriculum. There's the rejection of biblical studies as a HSC subject. There's a crisis, again, in secondary SRE. Sex education in state schools, of course, becomes a problem. The New South Wales Education Commission is formed under the RAND government and appears to give complete control to the New South Wales Teachers Federation. The New South Wales Teachers Federation, Archbishop Marcus Sloan described 
as humanist in philosophy, agnostic in religion and socialist in politics, not unfairly. Um, the MACOS crisis also erupted in state schools. This was a curriculum resource called Man, a Course of Study. And in fact, it was the MACOS curriculum that was the propellant leading to the establishment of many of the low-fee non-denominational -Christ uh, non Christian schools in the period between 1978 and 1982. If you talk to their founders, this comes up again and again, about which I've written elsewhere. In 1980, the church complains about textbooks for senior, for senior, uh, senior students, Don's party specifically, if you want to know. Concurrently, and perhaps consequently, there were several calls in the Synod for a coordinated diocesan policy for the establishment of new schools. Now, interestingly, for the first time in the history of the See of Sydney, the new Archbishop, Marcus Sloan, mentions nothing about education or schools in his President's addresses from his first in 1967 through to 1974, a period when the Synod and society is clearly in a ferment about education. The period coincides with the radical policies of the Whitman years and just preceded the long ascendancy of the radical Rand government. The governments, both federal and state, approach to the church at this time seemed in many cases to range from disinterest to disdain. And the synod rec records appear largely bewildered about the sudden decline of a long and fruitful companionship with state schools. However, the Archbishop does make education a central priority from 1975 when it was discovered that, owing to some injudicious property investments, the Skeggs group of five schools was about to become bankrupt, taking the diocese with it, a multi-million dollar scandal that included the disappearance of both $200,000 and the school council's legal advisor who fled to Brazil. The Archbishop from that point on makes education a priority. He was, after all, the titular chair of the Skeggs Council, although he hadn't actually attended any meetings up to that point. With a general shift back to the importance of Anglican schools, albeit without any coordinated approach, in the wakes of the Skeggs crisis, Archbishop Lone, in his far-reaching presence address of 1976, says that school is not just a place where boys or girls compete in games or cram for exams, it's a great spiritual laboratory in which men and women are seen in the making. So Marcus, in his last address to the Synod in 1981, makes a conspicuous point of symbolically singling out the King's School and St Catherine's as archetypes of the long tradition of Anglican education. The King's School and St Catherine's are, in a sense, representatives of all church schools. They are human seedbeds for the cultivation of character and intellect in the climate of Christian faith and tradition. It is only as they respond to that ideal that the loyalties of today become the strength of tomorrow. In that same synod, a report suggests that the time is ripe to commence building a comprehensive system of church schools and this, that this would be more effective than SRE, I quote. Another key shift occurs about this time that has grown into a central issue in the contemporary public conversation, that the church school becomes a defensive line for plural democracy. Marcus Lone again, the presence of some independent schools is a safeguard against totalitarian control of education, but also that their freedom and responsibility to make a significant contribution in a distinctively Christian context con constitutes a valuable component of the total education spectrum. Again, this is a relationship of church and state, but in this case, a defence of the true state, Westminster plural democracy, as opposed to the usurper state. This is interesting because the leadership of the church was only a relatively recent defender of broad enfranchisement plural democracy, <clears throat> although we find many firebrands amongst the clergy from the 1970s, from the 1870s onwards. The church as a whole certainly was not in favour of empowering the poorer Irish Catholic minority and up until the early 1950s, strangely, we find successive archbishops publicly supporting the white Australia policy. Throughout the period of the, of the 1980s, the Synod continues to indicate its support for SRE but the narrative increasingly shifts from cooperative patronage of the Anglican flock through SRE 
to evangelism and outreach through SRE. Archbishop Donald Robinson indicates in 1986 that he is convinced that SRE is one of the most strategic opportunities for Christian witness in our state at this present time. And so another momentous shift has occurred, but not a decisive one, and as far as I can tell, not an organised one. At the core of this conundrum was, and I dare say is, nominalism. Religious nominalism is a natural byproduct when there is a formal relationship between church and state. As citizens of the state are assigned or self-assigned a denominational category or, or a tribal affiliation. With the decrease of nominalism, the mission of SRE inevitably had to shift from tribal to general. And in the whole paradigm of church and state, I think the concept of nominalism needs much further examination. That the church senses its ebb in the broader culture is also maintained in the last great, great shift that I will address, which occurs in 1994. But began with the extraordinary vision of the Reverend, Reverend John Darlington in St Peter's Campbelltown. Does, does anyone remember John Darlington? Have any met him? A couple? With the revival of the parochial school in St Peter's Primary, then Broughton Anglican Secondary, and had John Darlington not suddenly died, his vision for a southwestern Anglican university for which, by the way, he had already procured the land. As we have already seen in the list of New Anglican schools, this re-emergence uh, of locals taking matters into their own hands by establishing new independent schools had multiple occurrences through the 1980s. Archbishop Harry Goodhue both formalises and propels the moves in 1994 when he expresses I would like to encourage the establishment of the low-fee, mission-minded Anglican schools in growth areas that offer some complementary models to the state system, linked through the local parishes with a strategy of church growth and local outreach. The council, which is now the Anglican Schools Corporation, with my strong encouragement, says the Archbishop, has been exploring setting up as many as 15 new schools in the next decade or so, a new step that could be sig as significant as the step in 1880. Harry Goodhue was being very symbolic by invoking 1880. It is arguable that Bishop Barry, it's arguable and perhaps not orthodox, that Bishop Barry and Archbishop Goodhue were the key leaders of the Sea of Sydney who attempted a coherent, strategically intended approach to Anglican schools, one that had a lasting and significant impact. Many of the other archbishops had a, many, had a much clearer vision for SRE, but interacted with the church schools in a far less coordinated way. Now, 1994 might seem a bit early to stop, but we know what happens next. SRE continued to decline in resourcing and in recent years has come under existential threat altogether from governments and activist groups. Conversely, the Anglican and other non-government school populations start to increase in an unceasingly upward curve in enrolments. Indeed, the enrolment figures are startling. 2023 snapshot from AIS, 422 independent schools in New South Wales, i.e. not Catholic systemic schools. 65 Anglican, 45 in Sydney Diocese, still the largest concentration um, outside of the Catholic schools. We have 790, 791 New South Wales state school enrolments, 450,000 total non-state school enrolments, which is 36.3%. But when we go to year 12, 45.5% of Year 12 students are in non-government schools in New South Wales. In Year 11, 43.2% and Junior Secondary, 42.1%. Over 90% of Australian non-gov schools are affiliated to Christianity. And in the last two years of Table 42B of the Australian Bureau of Statistics Education uh, Statistics Collection, I'm a researcher, um, the percentage transfer from state to non-government schools has equaled the total of transfer across the last nine years. 
previous nine years. And so there's a momentum happening. And so I return to the words of the inquiry in 1965. The diocese has never formulated a policy on education which coordinated its large responsibilities to the state system with the aims of its own schools. As far as I can discern, the diocese still has not formulated a coordinated policy. I might be wrong. But its schools have a rapidly growing share of the enrolment population, and yet with no overall guiding rationale or theory, or for that matter, unifying theology. Indeed, the Board of Education continued in one form or another, successfully or less, for 103 years, its name changing in 1994 to the Anglican Education Commission until 1922, when EDCOM was finally shut down. I might be wrong, but I don't think there is currently an overarching diocesan body for education. So I return to the guiding question with which we began. What is the nature and vocation of Anglican schools as educational communities in Australian society? I didn't formulate this question. It was workshopped last November by a group of eight academics and school leaders that we have informally created a group called PRACUS, Pracademics for Anglican Schools. This address in an informal way has become the first public presentation of some of the musings from this think tank, the historical piece being of particular interest of mine, but I have drawn on their philosophical approaches, including the head of King's, Tony George, for the ideas of church and state and nominalism, that Anglican schools are neither Catholic, where the state and church are understood to be reasonably as one, nor non-conformist, where the state and church are, have a hard separation. Indeed, the historical account shows that the Anglican Church has always wanted to be in a partnership with the state, to build a better society, and only occasionally is this framed as a theological question in the historical account. It certainly was not particularly theological for figures like William Grant Broughton, who stated in 1931 that the education in the King's School is not for the exclusive benefit of those upon whom it is bestowed, but for that of the entire community. It was just what Anglicans did and ought to do. So, the elephant in the room. Did the Anglican Church make a monumental mistake by backing state education in 1880? Should they have held their ground as the Catholics did? It appears now that the, the 1879 Concerns of the Catholic Church, which they published in an ad in the City Morning Herald, uh, to the horror of almost everyone, that conceding to the Public Instruction Act would lead to the decline of religion in their flock may have come true with the rise of big secularism in public schools. But having said that, it took a century, and it may be that public education was a correlation rather than a cause. Certainly in the last 30 years, Catholic schooling has not led to strong church attendance amongst their school graduates, nor has it in Anglican schooling. The youth trends all seem to be following a similar trajectory. However, if we consider the horrible legacy of the convict penal system, the chaos of the goldfields, the isolation of the bush, and the deprivation of the slums, the history demonstrates that public education enabled Australian children to read, to do sums, to become educated, and Australian society was born. Indeed, the first general inquiry into education in 1844 found that less than half of children of colonial descent had any education whatsoever. Imagine a society where half of the children couldn't read. Indeed, uh, when they first established the female orphan school in Parramatta, it was estimated that 30% of the girls were neglected by their parents, were running wild. If the Anglican Church had not co-designed and cooperated with the state in 1880 and the other Protestant sects in joining the cause of public education, then who can say what kind of backward mayhem would have reigned for the next century? into our lives today. The tragedy of Ireland, modern Ireland, 
which had abandoned the national system of schools that had been so emulated by New South Wales, may be in part attributable for the sectarian horrors that followed, the very sectarianism that the schooling system had sought to mitigate. Eminent Australian historian Professor Mark Hutchinson has also pointed out that the loss of the schools was also perhaps inevitable with the rise of the welfare state and the rise of the, popular, of the professional classes. In the early 19th century, the, which I find delightful, the parish clergyman was typically educated at Oxbridge as a liberal arts dilettante. Uh, do you note how many clergy archaeologists and paleontologists and linguists seem to be running around in 19th century England? Don't know if they ever did anything in the parish. They all seem to be um, studying Anglo-Saxon. Um, it was an easy thing for these clergy to slip across into the role of headmaster in and out of parish. In a largely uneducated society, the local clergyman was the expert and specialist in many things. The rise of the professional classes in the late 19th century and the narrowing of Australian clergy education to just theology and ministry degrees may have contributed to the, to the decline of the viability of the church school. There is much that I have not addressed here tonight. I have not addressed the key historiographical questions, a sin for a historian, though through what lenses should we interpret the history of Anglican schools? It's not all about the great chaplains and headmasters and archbishops, the great men. They're all men in the record. Name the great female principals for me. But we can all name Rod West and Reverend Travers. And there we go. I haven't heard of her, but I will. I can also name Frieda Whitlam, uh, but she was at PLC. Okay, good, good. I this is good. I'm learning new names. It's, I'm embarrassed that I don't know these names. Um, it shall be part of the project moving forward, I guarantee you. It's not all about the official records. I have not referred to the many noble and long and noble and short specific histories of specific schools. But we have seen enough that several purposes operated in Sydney Anglican schools. Note, I use the term purposes, not theologies. However, none of these purposes are alone sufficient to explain the nature and vocation of Anglican schools. First, there is the obvious one and the most recent one, that schools were there for evangelism, to bring unreached people back into the church. The second purpose <coughs> that has has been the notion of high quality connected to, if I may, the Anglican brand. In some ways, the connection of the Anglican school to the social ascendancy endows this seal of quality. The Anglican school brand, above all others, stood for quality education in the zeitgeist. Indeed, in the words of Marcus Sloan in 1977, it is desirable that a master or mistress should be a committed Christian, but Christian interest is no com compensation for lack of professional ability. This is, of course, in direct contradiction to a fundamental tenet of the non-denominational Christian schooling movement, that all teachers in Christian schools must be practising Christians. And that idea has extended to several of the newer Anglican schools as a core ethos. It has also echoed around many other Anglican schools in the last decade. It remains an ongoing tension that the House of the Clergy has been having with, if I may, the House of the Educators. I've just invented a whole new category in Anglican history, particularly accentuated by a statistical lack of teacher supply in general. A third and clear purpose of Anglican schools in the sources is that they were there to produce citizens who serve for the greater good. This includes seeking justice for the voiceless that still runs through all Anglican schools, albeit somewhat problematically when it comes to the matter of school fees. However, in the Anglican schools, the notion of training for good leadership has run most deeply through the records. This perhaps has much to do with the notion of the established church, that the Anglican community should be the natural source for the country's leaders. When we study the histories of particular schools, such as Shaw or King's, this idea is central and tied closely to martial leadership, 
with strong connections to the officer classes of the military. Indeed, the King's School uniform is still recognised as the oldest official military uniform in Australia. The eventual, eventual sanction of public education by the Anglican Church, I would argue, also equally related to this notion of service, a lineage running back to the first school established by Richard Johnson in the first colony to bring basic literacy and moral and religious education to the children of convicts. Indeed, it was the Anglican and other Protestant clergy in New South Wales and in all the other colonies who led and chaired and fomented the public school leagues that led to the Colonial Public, Instruct uh, public Instruction Acts in all of the colonies. Early colonial education soon became less about immediate survival, immediate survival, but still only half of children of colonial descent had any education whatsoever before the Public Instruction Act. So the backing of public education by the Anglican Church to its own loss was indeed for the greater good, for service to the community, and that is in the language of the time. A fourth purpose was the school's support of Anglican families to have their children educated as disciples of the faith according to their own religious beliefs. This is widespread across the sources, a purpose that was and is a frequent justification of all of the other religious schools in Australia. Consider the last week, the questions around the Law Reform Commission report. Parents should have the right to educate their own children according to their beliefs. This is central to the narrative. Scroll forward to today. And do these four purposes still characterise Anglican schools? Should they? Does or should the Anglican Church still have a normative relationship with the state? Are church and state, as the 1965 Synod Committee asserted, simply the appropriate, um, the appropriate controlling instruments of two types of society into which an almost contemptuous community organises itself? I cannot, indeed dare not, speak for the church in this matter. But Anglican schools, in fact all Australian Christian schools, have a real, live, active, fiduciary and cultural church-state relationship, whether they recognise it or not, or whether they like it or not. Part of our journey here today has been to explore how history might lead us to the suggestion that the paradigm of church and state is a more plausible and effective way to arrive at a coherent rationale for Anglican schooling, or indeed perhaps all Australian Christian schooling, rather than a theological approach. It is certainly a present gap in the theorising. It would be convenient if the history provided a definitive rationale for the nature and vocation of Anglican schools. Such coherences around schooling certainly exist. They certainly exist in the five great teaching orders of the Catholic Church. They have done for 500 years, or 400 years. First beginning with the development of the Ratio Studiorum, or the Plan of Studies in Jesuit education, 1599. The historical records show such coherence did not, indeed does not occur in Sydney Anglican schooling, nor Australian Anglican schooling in general. But I do think that the history indicates Anglican schools were linked into a great echo of legitimacy, of quality, of service to and participation in a great social cause that was transcendent, good, and ancient. The Anglican gesture towards the state was that they were there to help, not just as volunteers, but as a people with a goodly birthright. It was a partnership model that did not occur in the paradigms of 19th century Catholic schooling. Anglicans saw it as the right and privilege of the school to participate with governments to co-design good society and of the church. They did not, as 19th century Catholicism saw, that it was the right of the school to dominate. Nor was it their privilege, as many of the newer non-denominational schools did in the 1980s, to withdraw from society. <laughs> 
As we look back on the history and legacy of the church and the schools in Sydney, to its many hands, its countless volunteers, its million stories of life and love and learning, history inevitably leads us to contemplate what the future might hold. Is the life of the church, in the words of Archbishop Goff, woven into the fabric of national life or is the church to be shut away in the exclusion of its own pietistic groups, having no part to play in the affairs of the world? Are the schools, to finish with the words of Sir Marcus Sloan, the room we are in is in his commemoration, human seedbeds for the cultivation of character and intellect in the climate of Christian faith and tradition? Do we agree with him? that it is only as they respond to that ideal that the loyalties of today become the strengths of tomorrow. What will become of our loyalties of today? Will they become the strength of tomorrow? Or like so much that has gone before us, will they drift into the deep silence of the forgotten past? the shadow that swallows both passionate intensity and mediocre neglect alike. Time, as it always does, will tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, so, if you like to think about any questions you might like to ask. I might start off with one that's come in online. Uh, you say there was no theological basis to Anglican schooling, but surely, quote, we hate Catholics, unquote, qualifies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I'm not sure if that's a theology. Uh, <laughs> um, what we need to understand in the Protestant-Catholic divide in 19th century Australia, and right up really until immediate post-war, was a political question as much as it was a sectarian question. And it had to do with the very large Catholic minority that was in Australia that was affiliated to Irish Catholicism and the Irish independence movement. And so for a goodly period of time, many Protestant Australians actually saw Catholic Australians as insurgents who did not answer to the king, but answered to Rome. Now, this was a lot more violent and a lot more nasty than history often tells. There were literally shootings in the streets, brawls. Uh, the Anglican clergy who led the public school leagues were all members of the Loyal Orange Lodge, the uh, radically anti-Catholic Northern Irish groups. Um, the Athenian actually shot the heir to the English throne at Clovelly was executed for doing it. Um, Archbishop Maddox didn't take his hat off during the singing of the National Anthem in 1921 in Melbourne, but he did take his hat off, the singing of Irish nationalist songs. And um, Stuart Piggin has estimated that uh, in, in the period between 1921 and about 1933, there was probably about 100,000 Australian Protestant men under arms in secret societies, the New Guard, the Old Guard, who were waiting for the Catholic uprising which then morphed under the Lang government into the communist uprising, uh, with some close uh, ties in the pre-war to the Australian fascists as well. And so, We Hate Catholics is, is a, uh, it's a, perhaps a grotesque uh, ex uh, simplification, but uh, it, it was a political reality at the time. Other questions? Okay. Um... Can you tell us more about the Darlington University proposal? Ah, yes. For this, I have insider knowledge. Um, my father moved from the country to become the assistant minister for John Darlington in 1984. And I was chatting to my mother the other night, and she said, and she told me the story of how John Darlington wanted land for a university, and a parishioner came up to him after the service and said, here's your land. And so if John Darlington had not prematurely passed away, uh, it's quite likely that the will of John Darlington, which seemed to be unstoppable, would have probably produced it. The first 
uh, Anglican University, there is no mention anywhere in any of the sources of a desire for an Anglican university. Uh, it was seen that the University of Sydney was the Anglican university and that was sufficient. Can you speak to why there is currently no centralised diocesan body to manage education? Do you think this is needed and how could it be revived? I can't speak to the why and perhaps I might be wrong. Maybe there is a body or maybe there's one in planning, I don't know. Uh, there's certainly arms, existing arms of organisations like YouthWorks um, that are involved in educational activities and some sort of pre-service -pre training for teachers and so forth. Do I think something like this is necessary? Uh, if the church wishes to leverage the positioning of its schools with having 40,000 students, school-aged children, 36 weeks a year, five days a week, seven hours a day, and use that to achieve their purposes, whatever they are, um, compared to probably less than 20,000 school-aged children attending Anglican churches once a week, maybe once a fortnight, then I would say, yes, probably a good idea to set up a body. But the way that it is done needs to be done with close consultation with the educators, because it's the educators on the ground who really know what's going on and what's going to work. I encourage the diocese to explore these questions. You have my phone number if you want any advice. <laughs> okay, does the provision of teacher education through Christian colleges add to further division with, between church and state with no part to play in the world? This is a very good question and one that I have a lot of personal experience with in my other roles. The Synod on four occasions calls for the, uh, the training of Christian teachers for church schools from 1945 right up to uh, 1982, so four separate occasions. But the church has by and large seem to have a ambiguous uh, trending towards disinterested position to the idea of training its own teachers. I suppose it really depends on whether you think the training of teachers in current secular universities is sufficient to achieve the staffing needs of Anglican schools. And there's a strong argument to suggest that the hyper -sec secularism of um, public universities is trending people away from the idea that it is sufficient. And so the, obviously there's been a number of uh, initiatives set up in, the, in recent years to actually train Christian teachers through Christian affiliated colleges. But they're small colleges, they're all under-resourced. Aren't they Scott? They're all yes. under-resourced. Yes, David, they're all under-resourced. <laughs> <laughs> they're small ventures. Uh, and um, whilst I think they are having a decent crack at doing something about it, there's no organised approach. So if the Anglican Church thinks that they need to train their own teachers for their own schools, then there needs to be a concerted and organised approach. Does it contribute to the withdrawal? I think the development of Anglican schools in their newer context probably contributes to some sense of a further separation of church and state. I think the collapse of the, of the state schooling arrangement, uh, which was largely because of state schools, it wasn't because of the churches and governments, I think that has led to a series of unintended consequences, which has also seen the residualisation of disadvantage into state schools as more and more people leave and go into Christian schools seeking, amongst many other things, some sort of a values education. I, I actually think we're in a reasonably risky time for our civilization through education. That there is a divide appearing in our culture, but the answer is not to go back to the way it was. We need some seriously good education ministerial leadership at the federal and state level that says my job as an education minister is to be the education minister for all, not just the public schools, and to come up with a new social arrangement 
that will bring us together as opposed to drive us apart. Needless to say, no minister has done this yet. The last one who had a go at it was Julia Gillard. What contributed to the closure of Anglican schools? Was it external pressure from the state, internal pressure, or simply a lack of demand? That's a good question. Uh, there's a range of factors. Keeping in mind 45 have stayed open, uh, there was the rise of the secondary school in the post-war period. The churches had fulfilled the role of the grammar school or the secondary school where the state had really not been successful. You still had to pay fees to go to secondary school up until about 1930. It's a state secondary school, you still had to pay fees. Not many people went to secondary school. And so with the rise of that in the post-war, that need declined. Um, you had the increase of regulation by the state, particularly after the Wyndham scheme in, 19, in the 1950s, where the state more and more was imposing certain um, criteria upon how schools should operate and act. And that sort of regulation regime meant that a lot of the little sort of schools would close down and they didn't want to operate anymore and they couldn't be bothered. Some of the schools just depended on the personality of a, a single headmaster or headmistress. And when that headmaster or headmistress died or retired, the schools just disappeared. Um, so a range of internal factors, external factors. In the Great Depression, I think there was quite a few schools that went under. Uh, a number of schools went under in the late 1940s, and I think that had to do with the pressures of World War II and what had happened to the staffing with the masters all going off to war and so forth. Given the historic and political nature of the question you have posed, is it reasonable that theological articulation of the purposes for schools change? Um, is it reasonable that... The, can you repeat the last, last part of the question? Is it reasonable that theological articulation of the purposes for schools change? I'm not sure if I understand the question, but if, if I was, I, I think that the articulation of the theology of schooling, and I keep saying this to people, schooling is not a primary, primary theology, <laughs> it's a secondary theology. In a lot of ways, you can do school theologically with Islamic schools, because it is that far from the core of a primary theology, the theology that would, would articulate a church, for, uh, like the, the life of the church. Um, that's more of a provocation, that statement. Uh, there is, uh, this is controversial, and Dr. Jen George said this, so she can take responsibility for it. You will not find the Anglican church in the Bible. Nor will you find the modern nation state, nor will you find democracy, nor will you find massified public education nor modern schooling or the classroom. You won't find any of this in the Bible. And so, to a great extent, it really is about applied theology, finding the different strands of theology that, that apply to a particular circumstance. And this will change depending on what it is that you're looking at and what the time it is in and what the factors are. So the theologies, the, the four theologies that are put up earlier, are all relevant. But my complaint, if you like, it's a complaint, my issue is that, particularly in the last 50 years, the question of what it means to be a Christian school has primarily focused on, a Protestant Christian school has primarily focused on what is the foundational theology for what we are doing. When in fact, if you look at the functioning of these schools, the lived experience of these schools, much of what they do is not theological at all. Uh, for example, as Michael Jensen once said, schools, Christian schools are a community of, uh, are a gospel of grace and a community of law. And there's a big fat contradiction right there, right? <laughs> it's not a voluntary community. The, the students don't choose to be there. Uh, school teachers and prison wardens have very s similar careers, you know. Most of their clientele actually spend most of their time trying to stop them doing what they're employed to do. Um, so how does that work with New Testament theology and, uh, and so forth? Uh, 
Uh, I think it is a, an incredibly complex process. And I think, you know, uh, well, how do I get to Dublin, says the Irishman. Well, I wouldn't start from here. Uh, I'm not sure that the way to answer the question to come up with a coherent theory that helps school principals to work out what it means to do Anglican education when the newspaper picks up a thing and says, oh, you've got to sign something about marriage or somebody's, somebody's made a complaint. Um, I don't know that it helps if we start from a theological foundation. We need a, a much more coherent approach to what it means to do Anglican education. I think it is a different uh, formula, different paradigm to, to what the Christian Education National Schools are attempting to do with their neo-Calvinist um, covenantal theology which amongst all of the Protestant school movements is the most coherent. They have the most coherent approach. It's very foundational. So what Anglican schools do is going to be different to that. It's going to be different to Catholic schools, obviously. But I do think something needs to be put together, a theorising. And that's what the practice group is all about as well. It's coming up with a... It's a wonderful group because we don't report to anyone. We're just <laughs> dilettantes who sit around a table and come up with wonderful ideas. Uh, you referenced a for new fourth house of the Synod, the House of Educators. Do you have any thoughts on how this house might fruitfully engage with the other three houses? Uh, look, it was, a, it, was a, it was an affectation, uh, a, uh, if you like. <laughs> came, uh, came into my mind uh, late at night. Um, but in the particular context of now, in Australia where we have this extraordinary volume of enrolments and parents and citizens in their only experience of church, which is school, and you've got declining numbers in formal church, is there an argument to say we need to reconfigure the way that we understand ourselves as a deliberative assembly, as a parliamentary denomination? Because Anglicanism obviously is a parliamentary denomination. If there's this large section that is so relevant and so important and so pertinent that in fact has no formal recognition, then how is that managed in the structural approaches of Anglicanism? I think there's an argument to say, let's re rethink this 400-year-old structure because things have changed. So he's a two-part question. Can you see a future role for Anglican schooling in the low fee paying and perhaps more rural regional schooling environment? And is this an opportunity given a large number of families in these demographics are exiting public schooling for other options including homeschool? Oh, absolutely and in fact it's a reality uh, in New South Wales and in Australia everywhere. Anglican schools are being set up in in regional and outer regional cities and towns. Um, and in fact, some, some of the largest schools uh, outside of the metro are actually Anglican schools. So schools like um, Trinity Albury and um, Moama. Uh, the, there's, there's, uh, there's a great need for independent schools in regional areas. Uh, there's a great need for good education in regional areas, both in state and non-government schools. Uh, and so I applaud, I applaud the, the Schools Corporation at, um, merge or takeover of the Orange and Dubbo schools and setting up the Shellhaven Anglican, uh, the uh, Shell Harbour Anglican, Nowra, uh, and so forth. Uh, so if the mission of the church is aligned to a... a a social justice cause, as obviously Christ's preference for the poor as it should be, then where are our, our poor? Well, they're in the regions. What are we doing about it? Problem is, it's really hard to set up a school. It's really expensive, it's lots of compliance involved. It's not like the good old days where you just go and set up one in a garage and sit down all night coming up with new theologies of education. Um, there's such a high compliance environment and uh, the only, only, really the only way forward in establishing schools is independent schools joining together, I think, to do campus plants rather than greenfields, new schools, new names. So the big schools actually planting. That was actually an idea in the, uh, in the, in the mid-1970s. Uh, 
that the, the big established schools should actually do campus plans. And it was sent off to a committee. And the committee came back saying, uh, we, we, we don't think it's the time to pursue this. And that's the last that appears in the Synod records. David, uh, Jason Hobber. Thanks so much for your presentation. I was fascinated to see that, I think it was Bishop Barry or Archbishop Barry and uh, Harry Goodhue as the two kind of co most coherent mm. uh, thoughts around Anglican schooling. Do you have any additional insights from Harry Goodhue or, or what do you think he meant by complementary in terms of complementary uh, versions of schooling in Anglican schools being complementary to state schooling? I think there's, there's probably a lot of people living uh, who would have a much better insight into that question. I didn't know um, Archbishop Goodhue. Um, I suspect his use of the word complementary there is to not offend. Like we don't actually want to mess with what's happening in state schools. It's been the way we've been doing it for 100 years. It's fine. Nothing to see here. Move on. When in fact it's obvious it's not fine. And I think he's saying, and Harry Goodhue in a lot of his initiatives, I can't remember, was it Go for Growth or so he used to have these slogans, what was it? Vision for Growth, Vision for Growth. Um, I think he had this idea of the Anglican Church as an evangelistic expansionary in new growth areas and the school was, was an extension of that. Um, of all the archbishops, uh, he was about evangelism through schools. That's what he thought they were there for. But of course, when you actually look at the new Anglican schools that came under the, the colourful uh, leadership of Laurie Scandrett and um, the late uh, Dr John Lambert, um, none of these schools are just evangelistic schools. <laughs> if you want to do evangelism, sell all the schools for, for $3.5 billion and train a million evangelists. It's a very complicated way to do evangelism, education. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I, Bishop Barry, interestingly, uh, he, he was bishop, he wasn't, the see wasn't an archbishop until later, but um, he had a very centralised focus. But uh, Barry obviously had a number of other issues uh, that effectively saw him driven out of the diocese by the Irish evangelical faction. <laughs> Does the rise of secular atheism in Australia in the last 50 years demand a more robust theological understanding of schooling than earlier times? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? Firstly, I think we need to pause about the idea of the rise of secular atheism. It's a very shouty group, the secularists, the big secularists, very shouty. Um, but I'm a researcher, I like to follow the numbers. When you've got 45% of Year 12 students are in Christian affiliated schools in New South Wales, there's more in Victoria, by the way, the statistics are higher, then you've got to ask whether this is a secular country. I think it's a non, it's a bit kind of non-religious country, but there's something going on in the population that says, I want my child to be in that context where the, clearly on the enrolment form, they told me they were going to, going to talk about Jesus all the time. Well, that's fine. I don't mind if they talk about Jesus. I want them to have a values and religion and maybe not religion, but values or something. It's this soft spirituality that's a part of of the phenomena of Australia. It hasn't really been described or explained, but it's not the big secularism of France. It's not the hard secularism of those who would interpret the American Constitution as this big secular document, you know, and exclude all religion from public schooling and all the rest. And um, Catholic schools, Christian schools, have been taken to the High Court on matters of constitution, I think, on two occasions. Uh, and the High Court has come back saying, no, we really don't have much of a problem with this. Like, we're all kind of... A, we're not going to say anything about religion in particular. So um, the resumption of state aid was actually taken to the High Court by the Defence of Government Schools Organisation in 1981, the DOGS group, as they called it, uh, which actually had quite a few prominent Anglicans in it, by the way. And the High Court found that Section 116 of the Constitution actually didn't 
was not pertinent, that the state could legally fund church schools. There was no problem with section 116 of the Constitution. Um, so I, I think Australia is a far more complex place. We, are, we have the third highest non-government school proportion in the world with, with comparative nations. Eighth highest if you count everyone, but with comparative nations, third highest in the world. And we have the highest access to school choice in the world. These are OECD figures. Uh, and so, and 90% of those schools are affiliated to Christianity. So, do we need better theologies? Yes, I'm sure we do. We all need better theologies. Uh, but I don't think we need better theologies because of the rise of secular atheism. I think we need to have a better pathway or articulation for parents and for educators of what it is that we're actually doing. We seem to be doing something really quite significant, but we don't really seem to have the language to describe what it is that we're doing. That is the role of academics, is to find, and artists, uh, uh, to find the language of the images or the metaphors for what it is that we're doing as a civilization. So hopefully we can do that. If you have got any ideas, please tell me. Yes. <laughs> Um, firstly, thanks, David, for your presentation. Uh, very insightful, particularly on the, the legacy and the work done over the last uh, 150 or so years, uh, particularly for someone new to, to Sydney. Um, what do you think, uh, learning from history and, and the wonderful people that have gone before, what can we do in this climate we're in, um, particularly with increasing secularisation, what can we do to preserve um, quality Christian education. So, you know, as leaders in Christian schools now, what's your thoughts on, on the future and what we can do? Yeah, look, I think, I think that's a great question. And I'm going, to, I'm going to draw from the gesture of Anglicans, a sort of born-to-rule gesture, <laughs> uh, and bring it back up and say, why are we running? Who said that we don't have a right to be at the public table? When did that become a thing. Who says that Christians don't have a right to contribute to the public forum and the public debate and public policy? Who said that? Why is that a thing? I think we need to stop being scared. We need to stop being timid. And we need to start saying, look, we've got a church and state relationship whether you like it or not. We're saving the government $15 billion a year in recurrent education, education funding, which is, by the way, is why they'll, they will never reduce the, the private schooling sector size. No government that wants to govern will do that. We have a right to be at this table. We don't have a right to dominate it, to tell everyone what to think and what to believe. We don't have the, the privilege to withdraw. But I think we need to just muscle up and say, here we are. What are you going to do? Chuck us out of the room? Give us a go. Throw us out. See what happens if you turn the entire non-government Christian-affiliated schooling sec sector against you at the electorate. So that, that would be, so preserve is not the word I would use. I also interested to see what happens in the, in the phenomenon of having generations of children trained through Christian schools. What's going to happen in 10 years or 15 years time? Whether this will have a sudden and unexpected effect on the population. I don't know. These things are hard to predict. But certainly that kind of volume of people coming under the sound of the gospel, under the sound of the church, under the sound of Catholic teaching or Anglican teaching, um, that hasn't happened before. And so are we in a false dawn of secularism? Historically, in the long view, or even a moderately middling view, secularism is pretty rare. Atheism is even rarer. People are religious. And they will continue to be religious. The question is, how do you civilise that impulse, really? <laughs> but let's not assume for one moment that secularism is a norm. It is actually an aberration in history. And we have a right to speak. And what we have to say is useful. We're not here to disrupt and destroy, we're actually here to contribute and to help. 70% of non-government organisations in this country are run by religious organisations. What happens if you pull the pin on all of those? 
What happens if all the Christian educators suddenly decide not to, Christian, to, to educate in this country? Our contribution is real, it's valid, it's legitimate, and we have a right to speak. That's how I would preserve it. Thank you very much, David. Uh, we have reached 7.30, so I'm sorry we've run out of time for questions. Um, thank you for asking that, that last question. It was the top question on Slido, which I thought would be a good one to finish with. So thank you for, for asking that question. Uh, and thank you again, David, for my, my excellent privilege. and thoroughly researched talk this evening. Thank you. Uh, so I realised I forgot to introduce myself earlier, so I'm sorry about that. My name's Erin, I'm the archivist here. Um, I have put together a little display of um, items from our collections up the back if you'd like to take a look on your way out. Um, and if you would like to know more about our library, which is open to the public, um, just come and ask or look on our uh, website, library.more.edu.au. Thank you so much for coming this evening and thank you to everyone watching online. And we hope you have a good night. Thank you. And just one sort of last... Uh, Sorry, um, the St James Institute at St James King Street is is uh, is holding a seminar on Sunday afternoon, two o'clock. Two to four. Two to four. Professor Paul Losington, the director of the St James Institute, where I will be their guest on a panel of one uh, to answer <laughs> questions about this topic. So, if you've really enjoyed this and you want the party to continue, then come along to the St James Institute, two o'clock on Sunday. Thank you. <laughs>